Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of Notre Dame's program in constitutional studies, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to our first event of uh, the spring semester. Uh, classes start uh, today here at Notre Dame. We're starting it off with uh, quite an event. I'm uh, very excited about uh, our discussion this afternoon on the second Trump impeachment. We have an all-star uh, panel of some of the leading scholar, America's some some of America's leading scholars on executive power and, and the presidency. Um, a special thank you uh, today uh, to the uh, Montpelier Foundation, um, uh, James Madison's Montpelier. They're co-sponsoring our event. And uh, we have with us uh, Roy Young. Roy is the president and uh, chief executive officer of the Montpelier Foundation. And Roy, maybe you could say just a few words about, the, about Montpelier and, uh, and thank you again for co-sponsoring. You're very welcome. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I'd like to offer a few words of greeting uh, from Montpelier and the Robert H. Smith Center for the Constitution. Uh, James Madison knew that the United States of America's revolutionary commitment to a government by the people and for the people depended on a well-constructed written foundation. The United States Constitution is that foundational document. While the Constitution did not end debate on core governance issues, having a written document outlining the basic rules and tenets of our society provides a solid foundation that we can return to as the starting point for all of our debates. At Montpelier, the Robert H. Smith Center for the Constitution hosts events and programs that strive to help people from all walks of life gain a better understanding of the document that still serves as the foundation for our nation. Presidential accountability to the Constitution and the American people is indispensable to the health and maintenance of the Republic. The Constitutional Convention's emphasis on the legal limits of the exercise of power and the government, or excuse me, and the complete accountability of the government to the governed was reflected in the advice of James Madison to confine and define presidential power. The Constitution provides several mechanisms for checking presidential actions as a means of enforcing constitutional accountability. We are proud to co-sponsor today's program with the Potenziani Program in Constitutional Studies and the Tocqueville Program for Inquiry into Religion and Public Life at Notre Dame. Every generation faces circumstances the Founding Fathers could not have possibly predicted, and we have to turn to the Constitution again and again for guidance. We hope today's program will encourage informed debate among viewers and continuous improvement to our nation. Thank you again, Philip, for the opportunity to co-sponsor today's program. Thanks so much, Roy. Uh, I've taught many seminars at Montpelier, uh, and I just encourage everyone uh, to pay a visit. It's an absolutely stunning um, uh, place of our nation, nation's history. Uh, the tour, you can sit and uh, walk through where James Madison prepared for uh, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful treasure. So thank you, Roy, and uh, thank you to uh, the uh, Smith Center and Mont Montpelier. Uh, for those interested in, in uh, events on the Constitution, uh, our program here in Constitutional Studies hosts uh, discussions every few weeks. We have one later uh, uh, celebrate Black History Month. Michael Zuckert, a uh, former professor at Notre Dame, will be uh, giving a lecture on slavery in the Constitutional Convention. That's on February 25th. Um, we we're actually co-sponsoring another event with Montpelier later on this semester, a uh, debate on the Electoral College. So uh, please visit us at constudies.nd.edu where you can see all of our events. Um, it will be a busy, busy semester uh, for sure. Uh, we have a group of undergraduate fellows uh, here at the program, and one of the things they do is they introduce our speakers. So I'm going to introduce uh, Corinne Carlson. Uh, Corinne is a sophomore at Notre Dame. She's a constitutional studies minor, uh, one of our Tocqueville fellows. Uh, she's from Orange County, uh, California, but I believe has made it back to snowy South Bend. Uh, and Corinne, could you uh, introduce our three speakers? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. As Professor Munoz mentioned, my name is Corinne Carlson and I'm a Tocqueville Fellow here at Notre Dame. And it is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. First, Benjamin Kleinerman is a professor, a professor of political science at Baylor University, where he teaches on political thought and political institutions. 
He is also on the board of directors of the Jack Miller Center and the author of discretionary, The Discretionary President, The Promise and Peril of Executive Power. Next, Jeffrey Tullis is the professor of government at the Pro University of Texas at Austin. Professor Tullis author authored The Rhetorical Presidency in 1987, considered a must read for those interested in the evolution of presidential rhetoric. His most re recent book is Legacies of Losing in American Politics from University of Chicago Press. Finally, John Yu is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He's also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Inter Institute and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. His most recent book published in July of 2020 is Defender in Chief, Donald Trump's Fight for Presidential Power. Please join me in welcoming our three panelists for this discussion of the second Trump impeachment. Thanks so much, Corinne. And uh, fellows, why don't we go in the order that uh, Corinne introduced you. So uh, Professor Kleinerman, uh, you're up first. All right, well, um, yeah. I'd like to thank, first, thank you, Corinne, for that introduction and thank Notre Dame and the Program in Constitutional Studies for having, for putting this together and also to thank Montpelier for its participation in this event. If, and if none of you, if you haven't gone, go to Montpelier, M Madison's house at Montpelier, it's beautiful. And I think sort of underrated in comparison to Monticello. It's the, might be the place to go in Virginia, or at least that's what I think. It, it's maybe not as brilliant, but it's a beautiful Virginia home. So, um, and you know, for what it's worth, this is one of the few times that I don't, regret if this being a Zoom, South Bend versus Texas and so <laughs> in February. I'd like to, I have to admit being a little intimidated by per participating in this panel. Um, I can think of few scholars on the presidency more impressive or more, more well known than Je Jeff Toulis and John Yu. I've been reading their work for years and it's had a major impact on my own intellectual development and on my understanding of the presidency. In fact, I'd say much of what I know about impeachment comes from Jeff Toulis's work. So if he repeats what I say, it's on me, not him. Um, okay, so turning to our topic, I'll we'll say much about why impeachment is a necessarily political question. I plan to say almost nothing, or I think nothing about the politics of impeachment. That is the current politics of impeachment. I think quite simply that the former, former president should be impeached. The losing president incited a mob to attack a ca the Capitol just as Congress counted the electoral votes. This seems to me to amount to a kind of poorly executed, executed coup. And Trump then failed to live up to his constitutional oath by doing almost nothing to respond to the attack. He preferred instead to watch it on television. If we don't impeach this president for this behavior, we might as well delete the impeachment clause from the constitution. I'll make the, the case in what follows that impeachment is as much or more a political question as it is a legal question, but I'm not sure that case even has to be made. I think there's an argument that the former president's speech literally broke the law. He created an angry mob and then incited them to do violence to the Capitol towards which he pointed them, sort of pointed a loaded gun directly at the Capitol. That being said, I think it highly unlike, highly likely he won't get impeached. And I also think it highly likely that most of the Republicans in the Senate won't take their duty seriously. In preparing for this talk, I did what all scholars of American politics should do first. I read the Federalist Papers on impeachment. On the question of giving the Senate the power to conduct an impeachment trial, Publius writes, quote, the difficulty a place to get rightly in a government test resting entirely on the crisis of periodic elections will as readily be perceived when it's considered that the most conspicuous characters in it will, from that circumstance, be too often the leaders of, or the tools of the most cunning or the most numerous faction, Ted Cruz. And on this account can hardly be expected to possess the requisite neutrality toward those whose conduct may be the subject of scrutiny. In other words, the founder, founders would not have been surprised that the Senate seems incapable of putting aside its partisanship, partisanship and considering the actual merits of this impeachment. The founders attempted to encourage them to put their politics aside by reconstituting the Senate into a courtroom and bringing the Chief Justice 
himself in to conduct the trial. That is, the founders wanted these senators to do everything in their power to become something closer to objective jurors rather than partisan politicians. Of course, however, the founders seemingly could, not, could have made this even easier. If the aim truly is to consider the legality of the former president's action, actions, why not have the Supreme Court consider the case? Wouldn't these judges be able to evaluate legality better than senators? That is, after all, what they do. In this case, Trump's impeachment would be obvious to impartial judges in a way that it isn't obvious to partisan senators. To understand why the Senate has the power to convict and impeach pre former president, then we must see that impeachment and conviction is not, strictly speaking, about the law. Impeachment is both a political and a legal question which is to say that it's a constitutional question. To what extent did the president fail to live up to his constitutional responsibilities in such an egregious manner that he ought to be impeached? Because it is both legal and political, judges aren't capable of deciding it well. Publius writes, quote, impeachments can never be tied down by such strict rules, either in the delineation of the offense by the prosecutors or in the construction of it by judges. Judges are capable of using the law and the facts of the case to determine whether law has been violated. There are many things that a president could do that th though they might violate any law are still, they, though they might not violate any law are still impeachable. And on the other hand, as I'll talk about in a minute, there are many things that presidents might do which, although violating a law, are actually a fulfillment of their constitutional responsibilities. If a president were to announce that he hates black people and will do everything within law to make sure they cannot succeed in the United States, he would have violated no law. This would be within his first amendment rights. But although legal, it'd still be impeachable. Precisely because impeachment is about more than just politics, the Senate must be turned into a courtroom. Impeachment revolves around maladministration, and this involves the question of improper as opposed to illegal behavior. Whether the president has failed to live up to his constitutional oath, as is the question here, a constitutional judgment that cannot be made, it's a constitutional judgment that cannot be made in a court of law. The Senate not, ought not impeach a president merely because they don't like his politics, but impeachment is appropriate, again, quoting Publius as a bridle in the hands of the legislative body upon the executive servants of the government. More generally, impeachment must be conducted by a political body because it is, quote, a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. At a fundamental constitutional level, we need to think of impeachment politically because the nature of presidential authority itself is outside the law. Make no sense to impeach a president for illegal behavior, merely for illegal behavior. Their oath demands that they, quote, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. To do this, they might sometimes have to take actions that, if done by a private citizen, would be simply illegal. This isn't to say that presidents have an inherent right to take actions outside of or even against legal order. I'm not saying, to quote Nixon, that, quote, if the president does it, it isn't illegal. But I am saying that when, to take the classic example, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus despite not having the legal authority to do so, his behavior, though illegal, was constitutional. He fulfilled his oath even as he broke the law. If Lincoln were to, be, were to have been tried for impeachment, and there are many in the South who I'm sure would have wanted that, we ought not judge his law breaking, but instead judge his oath fulfilling. Because so much of what presidents do lies in the realm of discretion, it would make no sense to hold presidents to legal standards that don't apply to them in the same way. If the average citizen ordered, as Bush did on 9-11, that any plane that wouldn't come out of the sky will be shot down, it'd be a violation of the law. Because it was the president, it ought to be judged differently. Presidents can't generally be prosecuted for what they do as president, precisely because presidents occupy some realm of sovereignty that makes the law apply differently to them than to others. 
But even as presidents are somewhat free of the law in that sense, they are at the same time more controlled by constitutional commitments. Until Trump, there, there were all kinds of norms of presidential behavior that controlled what they could and couldn't do. To use their platform, whether it be Twitter or a press conference, to attack people in a personalistic and quite base manner isn't illegal, but it's definitely unpresidential. And in that sense, fails to live up to the constitutional responsibilities of the office. So I'd say, you know, some of Trump, Trump's action, while not, be, not illegal, would be unconstitutional in a sense. With all that in mind, the question whether he can be impeached after he leaves is also a political question that should be left to Congress to decide. In other words, the presidency, precisely because it's outside the law, has to also be judged outside the law, judged politically. There are good structural arg arguments for allowing this impeachment, else presidents wouldn't fare the repercussions of their behavior at the conclusion of their presidency. Just as Bill Clinton parted longtime political supporter Mark Rich at the conclusion of his, his presidency, so too did Trump incite a riot to attack the Capitol at the conclusion of his. And I don't think they're comparable. In the end, in order to tell Congress that it cannot impeach pre presidents after they leave the office, there would have to, I think, be a clear, open and shut legal argument. If there were no precedents for such impeachments and no way of reading the Constitution so as to permit them, perhaps then we should simply close the door on the Trump presidency. But it's a sticky and I'd say debatable legal question. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but well-respected constitutional lawyers line, line up on both sides of the question. And so rather than using the law to foreclose the critical judgment that we ought make right now about the irresponsible and unconstitutional behavior of, of a former president, we should instead encourage the impeachment to go forward so as to ensure such behavior is never permitted. Again, transitions of power have always been dicey in democracies. We have been fortunate enough that they've been never been so here. Hence, we must be vigilant against this kind of behavior and we must hold responsible those who commit it. Without a proposed presidency of impeachment, we can't exercise that responsibility. In other words, it's particularly at the end of a presidency that things get dicey and things get dangerous. Without the possibility of a post-presidency impeachment, that most dangerous time would enable to be controlled by the politics of impeachment. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Professor Kleinerman. Uh, Professor Tulis, you're up next. Thank you. I'm going to try to stick to my 10 minutes. And um, I want to begin also by thanking uh, Notre Dame and Montpelier, both places I have affection for. My, my first job in uh, teaching was at Notre Dame. And I, I did three or four summers uh, uh, programs at Montpelier uh, in their constitutional, the Smith Center for the Constitutional Studies uh, uh, effort that, um, um, that was described earlier. So thanks uh, to having me, for having me. I'm gonna make four points. Um, uh, one about the crime, uh, the second one uh, about whether you can be tried, whether you're not in office, the third one about why to do it now, uh, since uh, there may be prudential reasons not to go forward. And then finally, uh, a problem on everything that I just previously, uh, a problem posed to everything that I will have previously said in the three uh, points, the first three points. The first thing is this is a very, very serious crime. Uh, the most serious political crime in United States history. Now in the constitution, the the crimes, as you know, for impeachment are treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. And the tendency is, is somehow to try to get bogged down in legal definitions uh, of those elements uh, and particularly what high crimes and misdemeanors means. But I, I would like you to think of them as all, whatever they are, as species of a larger genus crime. And that's the way that it's talked about by Hamilton in the Federalist Papers that Ben was just quoting. Hamilton refers to all of them as adding up to, or as part of, or as instances of an abuse or violation of the public trust and an injury done to society itself, which he then describes as political 
with political written in all capital letters, by which he means not mere partisan politics, but a kind of threat to the constitutional order as a whole. And um, no alleged crime by a prior president has uh, come as close to the core definition, the genus definition of what it means to commit an impeachable crime as has Donald Trump. Now, uh, the article that he's charged with is, one, it's, it's only one article. And so one might assume that is, he's being charged with just a single crime. And in fact, if he uh, is subsequently charged under a criminal statute um, for incitement, it is, it, it, it is so far just one uh, charge. Um, but he's not being charged uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the Senate uh, under a criminal statute for all the reasons that Ben just outlined. He's being charged with committing a very, very serious political crime. And even though it's one article, it's a multifaceted case for what could be summed up as a gross abuse of office. Uh, and the first facet is the creation of the so-called big lie to deny election results that had been certified by Republican and Democratic officials across the nation, as well as uh, courts across the nation, including courts whose judges were appointed by him. Second, the mobilization of protests to pressure Congress to act unconstitutionally. Third, the actual incitement of a mob to violence and to the encouragement, uh, uh, the continuing encouragement of that violence. And fourth, um, and I was happy to see this in the house manager's brief because Bill Crystal and I uh, wrote an op-ed about this. This was not actually listed in the articles, but we argue and so do the house managers that it's, 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 it's um, further evidence of what it means to, further evidence that he did incite this violence was his dereliction of duty uh, during the time that it was going on for several hours, that he refused to, uh, to mobilize the resources of the executive branch the way a president is expected to. And there's some evidence that he in fact was even celebrating uh, the riot as it was happening. Okay, so that's, that's point one, that's the crime. Uh, the second one uh, Ben uh, touched on, which is, can he be tried when he's no longer in office, as is the case now? Um, uh, since the punishment includes, uh, upon conviction, removal from office and the possible disqualification for um, future office. And obviously, if he's convicted now, only the disqualification uh, would be subject to uh, a vote. And that would only require, by the way, a majority vote because he already is out of office. So as, as Ben uh, mentioned, uh, there are plenty of people that think uh, that he can't be tried because the principal point was to remove him from office. Uh, ben made all sorts of really good points about, well, that poses a big problem for uh, people who are committing uh, crimes as serious as this. Uh, at the very end of their terms. But I also would like you to think just as one thinks of the specifics in the constitution about what counts as a crime as species of a larger genus, one should also think of removal and disqualification as a species of a larger genus because, uh, and this is made clear in the house manager's report, the irony is most Americans think, well, the whole point is removal and this sort of addendum is disqualification. But in the actual historical construction of the constitution, it was just the opposite. Many of the state constitutions didn't even allow for removal of the impeached president um, um, or, or a trial until after the, uh, the person was no longer governor of that uh, state. And some of those uh, were cited during the uh, construction of, of our clause in the Constitution as uh, uh, part of an effort to make impeachment more robust by making it include both removal and disqualification. 
And at the very time that the, that the uh, clause was being constructed, uh, Warren Hastings <clears throat> had been brought back from being governor general of India in Britain and Edmund Burke was leading the impeachment of, Ed, uh, of, of Hastings out of office. He was no longer in office. Um, so the, these were the these were the texts, these were the models, these were the precedents for the actual construction of our uh, 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 clause. So what is the general objective of it if in fact the pieces are removal and disqualification? Uh, and again, I would urge you like with crimes to think a little bit bigger, to think at a higher level of, of abstraction. And here again is Hamilton uh, being sentenced to perpetual ostracism from the esteem and confidence and honors and emoluments of his country is the purpose of impeaching and convicting a president of the United States. And so what we have here is the occasion for, and this is my third point, why do it? What we have here is the occasion for a national reckoning, a national reckoning about what uh, Donald Trump has done to the country uh, most uh, egregiously in this last uh, month in office. Um, uh, Hamilton refers to national reckoning as a national inquest. It doesn't mean that this will be the end of it, but it's hard to see that one could have any such reckoning if in fact one just passed over this kind of act, a action for all the reasons I don't wanna review that Ben uh, just suggested it would uh, imply for future, future occupants of the office. So before turning it over to John, I wanna raise one, um, one uh, cautionary note to, the, to everything that I've just said, because what everything, everything I've just said suggests that it is possible uh, 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 to, to, to have a trial that is sufficiently serious, that lays out the case in sufficient de detail for the American people, that it can have enormously good effects for the purpose of restoring the constitutional order, whether or not President Trump has enough uh, votes to be uh, uh, acquitted. In other words, he might be acquitted, but if the case is, 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 is laid out clearly enough, um, uh, that doesn't mean you win in the long run. Um, you can sometimes win in the short run and lose in the long run, or you can lose in the short run and win, uh, or the, and the polity can win uh, in the long run. Um, but for that to happen, this has to be a very serious trial. It has to be conducted at a high order of constitutional argumentation. And my one worry is that the uh, House um, um, and the Senate made a mistake in inviting uh, the Chief Justice to preside rather than instructing him to preside because the Constitution is ambivalent about whether he presides in a trial of a president who is no longer president. It refer the Constitution says he shall preside but he shall preside of a, uh, over a trial of a president. And so there's this legal argument or an argument among lawyers, I should say, uh, about whether a president includes former presidents. And it seems to me that's a point for the Senate and the uh, House, uh, to uh, the Senate actually, to decide for itself. The Senate has the sole power of, of, of trial. And uh, that includes the power to interpret how the trial is conducted and in its own procedures, it can overrule the, uh, the decisions of the uh, chair or the chief justice if he is the chair. And in my view, it can determine that he needs to be the chair. He needs to be the presiding officer. And I think he does. And the reason I think he does is it's gotta be absolutely clear how serious this is and how beyond ordinary politics it is. It can't be Vice President Kamala Harris in the chair, and she realizes that and doesn't want to do it. Uh, and so it's currently going to be the President Pro Tem, Patrick Leahy. 
who's also going to be voting in this uh, uh, trial and is also obviously part of the majority party. What we want is to forget, forget about ideally majority party and minority party. We want to forget about majority leader and minority leader. All those things, all those distinctions should go away as the Senate recomposes itself into a new body, a completely new body, the same individuals in the same room, but a new collective entity. And that's signified primarily in the Constitution by two things. They're going to take a new oath, separate from the oath of office that they've already taken to be senators, and the Chief Justice of the United States would preside. So I'll just end with suggesting that um, there's still time for them to change their mind on that. I think they should. And if they don't, I think it has the danger of, uh, of uh, lowering uh, the quality of this trial from one of high politics to one of lower politics. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Toulos. Uh, Professor Yu. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, allowing me to join this great panel on this uh, most important question. I'd like to thank the Potenziana, Potenziani um, from Philly. I have to be able to pronounce Italian words correctly. The Potenziani program and the Montpellier program. I, I hope someday uh, to visit Montpellier, uh, although since I think I'm a well-known Hamiltonian, I'll have to check all my credentials at the door before I'm allowed into the high temple of Madisonianism in our country. And it's really great to be here with um, Ben and Jeff. I, as Ben said, I've uh, read their books and um, studied them, signed them in my classes. It's just a great uh, pleasure uh, to be with, uh, I think, two of the leading scholars on the nature of the American presidency and the nature of executive power. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to argue more like a lawyer uh, and less like a liberal arts professor, which is what I really wanted to be, but my parents wouldn't let me. Being Asian parents, I said I had to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, so I picked the closest thing to political scientist I could find. So let me um, uh, just uh, take their uh, points one by one, uh, but uh, just start out my basic idea is I don't think it's a very prudent step for the Senate to hold a trial uh, for uh, President Trump, um, in part because I think the only things that impeachment are for primarily to remove someone from office who is a threat to the constitutional order, which we, I think we all agree on, uh, was effectively uh, done by the American people on the November 4th election, uh, in the night of the November 4th elections. And then the second penalty, disqualification, which is all that's remaining, is another thing that the American people can do. They can choose, as I expect they would after all this, never to elect Donald Trump again. Although I think people have different fears, actually both Republicans and Democrats have fears that he may run. I think the American people are the ones who can really render a verdict on whether to disqualify President Trump. If that's the case, then uh, my argument is, do we want to take a step where we are going to be setting a number of precedent, precedents permanently that could change the relationship between the executive and legislative branches moving forward? Another theme I want to throw out uh, more for the Notre Dame uh, students is that I think this is a classic case, I'm sure uh, Professor Munoz uh, loves presenting these to you where we have, I think, a difference between what I sometimes call the idea of a perfect constitution, the idea that if we've got a problem, we've got to find some place in the constitution that fixes it because we have this idea that our constitution is perfect. And I think that often conflicts with the constitution we have, uh, which is imperfect. And sometimes the founders didn't think of all of these cases and controversies we're going to reach in the future. I think this is a really good example of that. Um, if you look at the way that our legislative and executive branches interact, uh, many people said that uh, they feel that the founders just didn't create enough checks on the executive. If you look at parliamentary democracies, they have things like no confidence votes. They can't just remove the prime minister as leader of their party. There's a lot of different ways that the legislature controls the executive. Uh, the founders, our constitution doesn't have that. Right? They have uh, you know, this extreme measure of impeachment, but they don't have all of these other 
sort of other measures to strike back at an executive or to hold one responsible who has left office. Uh, and so I think, unfortunately, because I'm not here to defend everything President Trump did, but I think, unfortunately, I don't think this case falls within the clear mandates of the Constitution. And so I say prudently, uh, I know uh, people who are uh, students of American political development history love this idea of prudence or statesman or stateswomanship. The idea is that uh, why take this step now, given that President Trump's no longer in office and we can choose to disqualify him if we so choose. So the first is to talk briefly about the actual uh, charge. And this, I think, is the difference between law and politics. I agree uh, with Professors Tulis and Kleinemann that you could make a case that President Trump committed uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. I agree that it is not just a legal question. Uh, the federal papers are quite clear about the fact that it could be what's thought of as a political offense against the body politic, is Hamilton's words. Um, the problem is that a lot of the things that uh, we've all discussed so far about the things that President Trump did were not actually charged by the House uh, because I think the House rushed, it strangely rushed to get the thing out of the House, but then delayed until after President Trump had left to actually hand the articles of impeachment over to the Senate. But if you read the article, it charges President Trump with incitement to insurrection. They didn't have to charge him with a criminal offense. They could have charged him with abuse of power or dereliction of duty or failure to execute the Constitution and the laws with regard to the electoral count, uh, but they didn't. And the problem is that it's a factual question in many ways whether Trump did commit incitement. Uh, the Supreme Court in a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio has actually very narrowly constrained the crime of incitement because they're worried about free speech concerns. Uh, Brandenburg itself is a case uh, involving a KKK a speaker in Ohio who uh, was ranting with anti-Semitic uh, statements. But the court said, uh, not only do you have to say things which look like incitement. And here, if actually, it's hard to say that President Trump ever called directly for violence, but you also have to, the person, the speaker has to think violence is really about to occur that's imminent and that objectively you have to think it was likely but the most important thing is you actually have to show the words where the speaker actually calls for violence. Uh, the House in its rush actually did not conduct any kind of hearing or investigation to show the facts whether that occurred. I actually think the interesting question, one of the interesting questions is whether the Senate will allow evidence to present it and witnesses to be brought forth to actually make the argument one way or the other. What did President Trump say? What was going on? in terms of the riot at the same time, before or after? Was there any connection between the two? So I think uh, that you could have a lot of other questions. You know, uh, President Professor Tulis' claim for a grand inquest, but the House, by writing its article of impeachment the way it did, excluded all of those. And I do think one thing is, you, I totally agree, impeachment is a political process, but I also think it is called a trial and the Senate has to limit itself to trying President Trump with the crime that he's been indicted with by the House and nothing else. Otherwise, you could uh, turn the whole affair into a, is President Trump a bad man or do we just as Congress want to control the executive more? Uh, but then let me turn to the second uh, question, which is, uh, I think, the harder, a very hard and close question I made, which is, can the Senate try someone who's no longer in office. Uh, the constitutional text does not explicitly say that you can. Uh, the House has the sole power to impeach. The Senate has the sole power to try impeachments. And then the other main provision in Article Two of the Constitution says uh, the president, the vice president, and the executive officers of government, when they're convicted of impeachment, can be removed and disqualified from office. So uh, people who say that uh, President Trump can be impeached rely on that phrase, the Senate shall try all impeachments. Their argument is the House has the power to impeach. When it actually voted on the impeachment, President Trump was still president. And so that impeachment was valid. And so then uh, the Senate can just try 
all valid impeachments. Uh, the problem is Article 2. The language says the president, the vice president, and executive officers. It doesn't say and former presidents, vice presidents, and executive officers. So uh, does that constitutional text in Article 2 that establishes the presidency and the executive branch altogether, does that constrain how far the House and Senate can go with this power over impeachment? The Constitution doesn't in Article 1 of the Constitution, which establishes Congress's sole limited enumerated powers, actually define who else can be tried by impeachment. So that, uh, you know, like uh, good uh, uh, interpreters of the Constitution, we turn to the history to see if there's any meaning behind this. Um, I agree with pretty much everything Professors Kleinerman and Tula said about the purpose of impeachment, what Hamilton said about it. I mean, it really is a kind of Hamiltonian idea, um, what they've said about the British practice of impeachment. Uh, I think everyone has to admit that on this narrow question, though, can a former official be tried in the Senate? The founders during the Philadelphia Convention, the state ratification debates, the Federalist Papers, all the standard sources say nothing explicit about it. Um, I think even people who uh, are in favor of impeaching President Trump, uh, who are originalists, say at best you can make inferences for two, two statements made in ratification debates, but they admit it's not really clear. They just almost, you have to say, maybe it's an assumption of what those speakers were saying. I think it's fair to say just the debates themselves don't provide any clue. So to me, uh, there are two, for to me as a practicing originalist, I'm, I'm a practicing, I hope to reform, but I'm still a practicing originalist. Um, there are two pieces of evidence uh, that seem to me to be important. One is, um, uh, Professor Tulis mentioned this, um, state constitutions at the time uh, specifically mention that you that the uh, legislature can try not just officials but former officials and sometimes one or two say only former officials and so uh, I think it's common in constitutional interpretation to compare that to uh, the federal constitution and to say well the founders knew easily how to provide for the impeachment of former officials because they've done it in the uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Delaware constitutions. And one, 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 one other, I think. Why wouldn't they put it in the federal one? They had all these uh, models, which they clearly considered at the Philadelphia Convention. In contrast, uh, uh, you know, by the accounts we have in the history, the founders really looked closely as uh, for models for the presidency to the New York and Massachusetts constitutions, which were seen by the people who showed up in Philadelphia as particularly successful. Uh, and those two constitutions came a little bit after the first wave, which provided for the impeachment of former officials. And those constitutions did not allow for it. And so I would just think as a, to, to me, as an originalist, that absence of that provision in the federal constitution represents an explicit choice. Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, as an original, you would look at would be the British practice. And I think this is the problem uh, that besets the people who want to argue that the Senate can try former officials. Uh, again, it's a, I think it's a common one for constitutional interpretation it costs lots of uh, questions. Uh, for those Notre Dame students out there who study Phil's, uh, Professor Munoz's books about religious liberty and the Smith decision, this is in that as well. It comes up in lots of uh, questions is uh, the British practice was A. Does the federal constitution do B or does it do A? Does it, does the, do the, did our founders intend to incorporate British practice or did they intend to reject it? And some parts of the constitution I've argued quite strongly that they did. And I think we have some differences on the panel about did the, Brit, did the Americans want to incorporate British notions of the executive power? Um, I would say that in this case, the founders actually, rather than accept uh, a, a sort of non-textual impeachment power by incorporating the British practice, I think if you look at what they say, they, they rejected large parts of it. And so the question is, 
and again, the absence of a text that clearly says you can try former officials, do you read it as if they thought they were incorporating the British practice or not? The British practice, I would think most of us would find quite dangerous. In the British practice, uh, the British parliament could impeach anybody, not just the president, not just former presidents, but people who'd never been in office. What if a Republican Congress someday impeached George Soros? I hope some people are not listening and getting any ideas out of this. But suppose they, they just thought, oh, George Soros is a threat to the, the American democracy. Let's impeach him too. Uh, let's impeach him for treason. Actually, that's what the British Parliament could do. The British Parliament could actually sentence people to death for treason who had never held government office. The problem with saying, I think, that we're going to accept a British practice that includes former officials, even if the constitutional text doesn't have it, is that the British practice was much more expansive than I think uh, uh, the founders ever would have wanted to adopt. And so you have this, I think, this problem of constitutional interpretation. What is the lim where do you find the limiting principle on impeachment once we start arguing that who it's subject to and these other elements of it are really up to political decision. Last point I'll just make really quickly and then uh, really look forward to uh, our discussion and questions is uh, think about the structure of the Constitution. I'll end with this is, um, you know, we commonly misinterpret, I think, the founding as an effort to uh, constrain the executive, to limit the executive. Uh, and then I would agree with. Professor Kleinemann, that you know, impeachment could be a powerful deterrent on future executives by using it in a certain way now. Uh, that is true, I think, of the early states. Right? The early states, like Pennsylvania, my home state, uh, had, which was uh, their constitution was written right after the revolution in 1776. It had a 12 member executive chosen by the legislature who could only hold office for a year and could never be reelected to that office. I could see a world where having a very powerful impeachment system makes sense if you think the main threat to constitutional governments is the, exec is the executive. But I would say as the revolution proceeded and then as you got to the founding of our federal constitution, uh, I think there was an effort to restore the executive. Uh, you see the return of the executive branch unified in one person. You see the inclusion of powers that were deleted. You see the rejection of the idea that Congress would elect the president. And I would argue um, you, see, you see a rejection of these kind of broader structural efforts uh, to use impeachment to contain, except in the way that's set out in Article 2. It would seem, it just would seem weird to me to think that the founders would have tried to rehabilitate the executive in the way, that, and we can always argue about how far did they go in rehabilitating it. Uh, but do we think they would have also wanted to keep along uh, this expansive British view of impeachment? So uh, thanks very much. Uh, look forward to comments and questions. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I, I share, I actually have to disagree with Klein, Professor Klein very strongly. He said he wished he were not in Notre Dame right now. Uh, I just looked at the Notre Dame webcam and as I expected, the whole place is filled with snow, but snow is a lot better than living in California. Despite the great weather, it is 65 right now, it is sunny. Corinne is from the Orange County. It does look the same as when you left. But I would rather go to Indiana to get my vaccine right now than try to find one in California. Thanks very much, everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's see, we're gonna turn to Q&A from those who are on the, on the Zoom here in a minute, but let me, let me pose a few topics of conversation for our panelists. Um, let me start with a constitutional question. Um, if I understand uh, Professor Tulis, right? Professor Tulis says, look, you have to understand uh, impeachment in light of its more abstract ends or purposes. Uh, that includes removal, but not just removal, also disqualification. Um, and because a former president like President Trump uh, could, is still eligible for office, it's, a, it's proper to conduct a trial, an impeachment trial um, in light of the disqualification provision. Uh, Professor Yu, if I understood you correctly, you say in response to that, well, that would imply if disqualification is the end of the impeachment provisions, 
anyone could be disqualified. Uh, and therefore, you, there's no way to limit it just to former office holders or former office holders. Um, I'm tr trying to summarize uh, some complex things. I, I think that's the basic essence. Maybe Professor Tulis, is, is Professor you right on that, that an implication of your position is that anyone can be impeached? No, I, I didn't, I don't see, I don't see anything at all about why this applies, anything I've said to anybody other than the president. I mean, the, the impeachment provisions with respect to the president are actually different and the limited ability of impeachment to other governmental officers. And there's certainly no hint that you can impeach somebody that's not a governmental officer. What I was struck most about John Yu's remarks is that uh, he's well known for having a strong presidency view. One that in some measure I share, and the measure that I share is he would suggest that the project of making this constitution had as one of its fundamental features reintroducing a strong executive into the national aspect of American governance. I think that's absolutely right. So that it wasn't a matter of constitutionalizing a strong executive, it was in some me measure as he has pressed executivizing a constitution, making executive power stronger. Um, now, I, I don't want to get into the, the weeds. There are some things he's argued that I wouldn't agree with, but I think that that general proposition is actually true and can only be defended. It can only be defended with a robust impeachment process. That's how you satisfy the challenge that Hamilton raises on behalf of the Anti-Federalists and Federalist 70. How do you make a really energetic, a really strong executive consistent with the genius of Republican government? It's a struggle, but it has to be attempted. And the attempt to do that is the impeachment process. And so ironically, um, and I'm surprised that John doesn't go this way, it is the robustness of an impeachment process that actually legitimizes some of his more controversial views. Okay, John, you want to comment on that? The, that uh, a robust executive would require a robust check, and therefore the strong executive comes in tandem with uh, a strong impeachment provision, which again, it would seem to me, I, I don't see how, uh, Jeff, if you're right, impeachment is limited to officers and former officers. I don't see where the constitutional text so limits, the, so limits impeachment and conviction uh, in light of your understanding of its purposes. But let, let me go to John first. Yeah, I, I, that's my I, I, that's my argument on the constitutional text. It's almost like a lacuna, or um, you know, you might you, you, know, you might have said uh, Jeff that was a mistake that they just didn't drop that phrase in uh, because uh, it does seem to me that you uh, if you really wanted to have a powerful impeachment uh, system, you would allow for the impeachment of private citizens as well, like people who are close to the throne, as it were, but held no office. Um, which was what happened in uh, Great Britain. Uh, no, I actually, I have uh, argued that the impeachment power should be uh, broad. I do agree with uh, both of you that um, it's not just crimes. You know, it doesn't include what we could consider political offenses. Um, I actually might go farther and say it goes even beyond dereliction or failure to enforce the constitution. You know, there is this argument that scholars have about whether it includes maladministration and whether it includes bad character even though the objective uh, performance of the job might be, uh, the president's job might be okay. Um, but I also worry uh, that you, the founders, and they seem pretty clear about it, they did not want it to turn into a system where the Congress was really controlling the president either, right? That it, they didn't want it to be a non-confidence uh, motion like you would have in a parliamentary system. Uh, you know, this is where you see Hamilton's discussion about why is the requirement for the removal of the president two thirds. Why is it so high? Uh, and he says, you know, so that it doesn't become this partisan tool. Um, and so I think, I, so this is the hard thing is just like, they, they did want to have impeachment as a check on the president, but they did narrow it in significant ways from the way it had operated under the British system. And I think to me, the only question is whether this uh, failure to address the trial of a former officer uh, fits in with that vision. I agree, Jeff, using the impeachment to sort of make up for the uh, energetic executives at the, the 
framers reintroduced uh, after these uh, failed revolutionary constitutions. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, just one quick thing. I mean, I just echo what was already said, but I think it's worth saying as clearly as possible. I think impeachment is a necessary complement to the kind of executive that the constitution was creating. That is one of the things I was trying to trying to say is the extra legal nature of presidential power requires political impeachment. I think the, the constitutionality of one has to be complemented by a check sufficient to check the nature of that first authority. So. Um, that's why I, I mean, John, your characterization of my position, I think Jeff's position, impeachment isn't intended to weaken the presidency. It, it's intended in a certain way to strengthen the presidency. So, yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to uh, questions in just a minute. Um, we have a tradition here in the program in, of uh, allowing our Notre Dame undergraduates to ask the first questions. Um, certainly won't limit it just to the Notre Dame students, but if you could use the raise hand function, uh, that way I can uh, uh, find you and I'll ask you to introduce yourself and un unmute you. So please uh, use the raise hand function. I wonder if I could um, ask uh, John and Ben to comment on uh, uh, Professor Tulis's observation about uh, the chief, it, we would dignify or heighten the um, uh, trial uh, if the chief justice presided. Uh, any thoughts about that? Uh, sure, to, uh, to be uh, narrowly textualist, I think, uh, again, this is an issue where I think the conflict between what would make good sense, yes, if we are going to have a grand national inquest, as Hamilton suggests impeachment can be, uh, and it is the president or the former president, should the chief justice be there? But the constitutional text only says when the president is on trial, you know, chief justice is a trial judge. Uh, and doesn't provide for the chief justice's presence. And in fact, um, the founders rejected the idea of the Supreme Court actually being the court of impeachment. And so this uh, presence of the chief justice, I think is this narrow exception to, uh, and I think this bolsters our argument that's a political issue. Let's keep the courts completely out of it. Uh, you know, they were worried that this would actually politically corrupt the Supreme Court if they were too involved with impeachments. But then that creates a textual problem uh, what is actually President, ex-President Trump's status as a defendant in an impeachment trial? If he's not the president, then the chief justice can't preside. If he is, if the chief justice does preside, that is actually an implicit, that would be Roberts's, Chief Justice Roberts' almost implicit agreement with the theory that Trump kind of falls in to Article II's president, vice president, executive officers because he had the office at one point. So I think that uh, to me, actually, uh, the chief justice had to refuse to show up as a trial judge um, because otherwise he would be blessing a theory of Trump's status um, that he, you know, as a justice, uh, as you know, the, the chief of the judiciary, he actually in the constitution really does not want him, or does not want the courts to actually say, be involved one way or the other. Let me just say that, that that's an obvious point, and I, I think it's a, it's a tough point, but the Constitution really is open to two interpretations. It could be that it's the president at the time of the charge, all right, and, uh, or it could be, as John is suggesting, the person who's actually president at the time that the trial is actually going on. Um, now, if it could go either way, but the, there is something to, to to, 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 to countenance the interpretation that it's the president at the time that he was charged. Because let's imagine that, we, that, that Trump still was president, that he, he was convicted, he was removed from office, and then they were taking a separate vote uh, on whether to disqualify him. He would no longer be president and the chief justice would still be sitting there doing it. So uh, um, there's textual support in the structure and logic of the constitution to go either way. And it's the Senate's call on how to do that. And I think the larger purpose is the argument that's laid out for why the trial is in the Senate and why the chief justice is brought over to the Senate that ought to, uh, that, that, that ought to govern this, not the sort of technical question about whether he's president at the moment. 
Yeah, I, I think they're exactly that? the same. I mean, in fact, it, it just doesn't seem to me that the text is sufficiently clear to, it's ultimately up to the Senate to decide whether to ask him to come. I think there are good reasons to ask him to come. I think that the, I, this is something that kind of, the importance of it as a trial is heightened by bringing the Chief Justice there to, to, to conduct it. But I'm not sure it's constitutionally required. Okay. Uh, John, can I press you on one point, a textual point? Um, uh, Article 1, Section 3 uh, involving the Senate says, uh, if my memory is correct, uh, the Senate shall have all, uh, the Senate shall have power to try all impeachments. And I think all impeachments is the, the type, all is the, uh, wouldn't this, um, uh, if, a, if a president is impeached or if anyone is impeached, but um, Clearly, it was uh, constitutional for the House to impeach the president while he was president. Given the constitutional text, the Senate has the power to try all impeachments. Doesn't that decide the question that the Senate has power to do the trial? Yeah, this is a, a sort of textual variation on Jeff's argument. Uh, you know, if the impeachment is valid at the time it's rendered, then the Senate trying all impeachments could therefore uh, include any impeachment, right? That, that that's now that I, there's um, two things here. So one is um, when it says all impeachments, it could mean that. I think it's actually referenced to other impeachments that aren't set out. So one actually the impeachments that have occurred most of the time in our history have been judicial impeachments, and those are not really set out very clearly. Right? The the, it, the um, Constitution says you, you're a judge on good behavior, and that's about it. And so. I mean, this is actually one of the better arguments, I think, for people who say there is a kind of broader non-textual power of impeachment because they would say, otherwise, how do you fit judges in there at all? They're not discussed anywhere. Um, but I think that might be what all impeachments refers to is uh, other kinds of valid impeachments. But then that just collapses back into the question then, is a uh, president who was right, impeached but then he leaves office before the trial occurs. Is that a valid impeachment? I don't think that really gets us anywhere. It just forces us to decide the basic question. Also, let me ask, said, said here are the facts. I mean, um, I, I, I think this is uh, putting the ball back on the other side of the argument is here you had a case where the House did quickly impeach. Um, they could have sent it over to the Senate with about just, on, just under two weeks to go before uh, January 20th. Um, I agree with Jeb and Ben that how the Senate runs the trial, what process they want to use, how fast they want to run it, completely up to them. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a constitutional question, but only the Senate gets to interpret. They could have had a trial easily before Inauguration Day. They sought not to. So here's the, I mean, I'm not saying that the House thought about this way, but here's the thing that might concern you as a structural matter is the House waited until the president left office to hold, to send the impeachment articles and then try him. Does that cause anybody some concern that houses might hold impeachments dangling over the head of presidents during their terms or wait until the president leaves office and then is no longer able to marshal the kind of defense that Hamilton thinks about, right? That we're, it is a political thing. So a president who's out of office and then is tried is obviously going to be much, much politically weaker than a president who's still in office and still part of, right, connected to the party uh, in the Senate. Yeah, uh, Jeff and Ben, and let me just add one question to this. Uh, can, maybe you can also comment on John's earlier point about the actual articles impeachment that the House sent over uh, and, John's, and John's thought too limited to have the type of trial that Jeff had uh, suggested would be helpful. So uh, maybe both those questions. First thing is that the, the House did ask the Senate to conduct the trial quickly and McConnell said he wouldn't do it. And subsequently was the decision on when the timing would be after the uh, inauguration, but the intention of the House explicitly uh, was to have a trial before uh, before it. They asked to do it, and it was McConnell that turned it down. I was thinking about your points earlier, John, about the article, and what I was trying to say in my remarks were, the article itself covers three of the four aspects of abuse of power, 
in its description of what it means by insurrection. It does not explicitly mention dereliction of duty, although I argue that that can be used as evidence for the three that it does mention. So I think that you can read that article one much more like the kind of political charge that it intends to be and not so legalistically. It might not actually, you know, I have no idea whether his case would stand up as a criminal case for the reasons that you articulated. Um, but as a, as a political charge of abuse of office, it actually did contain a, a lot of components. It didn't just say the word in uh, insurrection. And then the house managers memorandum explaining and justifying and arguing for it goes even further in laying out all the details that I quickly summarized. Yeah, I would, on that point, I would just say that I, I found it a little unfortunate that the House didn't make more clear that it's not simply a criminal question, that there's more to it than just the, the criminal question of incitement. In other words, because I think the problem is the way it's written, Jeff, I think you're right that it could be interpreted this way, but I think there's political ways to interpret it such that you narrow it to the mere Brandenburg sort of criminal question in a way that I don't think they wanted to. They wanted to, to, to make it a broader constitutional question than it, than it sounds. I, I suspect that's partially because understanding impeachment as something more than merely criminal isn't yet the settled constitutional position. You know, in other words, all the way back throughout, Jeff's written well on this, throughout American history, we've in a certain way mistakenly viewed impeachment merely as criminal rather than as something broader. And I suspect the House's procedure has to do with that initial initial conception. Okay, I'm gonna go to David uh, Painter here. David, if you could unmute yourself and introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question. David, are you with us? Okay, let me introduce a question that was written in the chat by uh, Ryan Gonzalez, um, uh, procedural question. Uh, how, uh, Ryan asked, how would abstentions affect the number of votes required for conviction? So if a Senator abstains. John, you're the resident lawyer here. Oh yeah, it, it, it's, it's gotta be two thirds of the senators present. So it would, actually this is uh, a side question that uh, Professor Tulis raised, right? If, um, Senator Leahy is the chief, uh, is the trial judge we don't know whether his vote counts. Does he get to vote or not as also a member of the Senate? If he doesn't, then actually it's uh, the number of senators potentially present drops to 99, and then you only need 66 votes to convict. And so abstentions would, right, they would change the numerator. Is this right? This is why I went into law. I still don't remember. The, the numerator is changed, but not the denominator, right? So uh, an abstention makes it harder, I think, to get to conviction, because you still need two thirds present. It's, and it's present, it doesn't say voting, it's present. Uh, Bob Brown asks, uh, the House managers uh, in their brief um, on page 59, argue that article one refers to person or party uh, as opposed to civil officer. Um, do you find this distinction to be significant in the consideration of whether or not a former official can be tried? As a little context, this gets it, um, to the question of can a former official or even a non a potential official, non official, be, be tried? Uh, the fact that uh, the constitutional text, the argument here would be that the constitution, constitutional text is precise. If uh, they meant, if the drafters meant only an uh, office holder could be uh, tried, they would have said uh, an office holder. Instead, they say a person or a party. Uh, John, maybe we should uh, direct this to you. Yeah, I mean, this is the, I think the fundamental cost, interpretive problem is um, the impeachment power doesn't really, ex, is, doesn't, the constitution doesn't really fill out the details of the impeachment power in this way. Um, it doesn't actually contain any description of who's subject to it or not in article one itself. And so uh, you could say, right? Well, if it doesn't say person, it doesn't say part, it's limited to officials. Um, that article one doesn't actually have a limitation on anybody one way or the other. And so in law, we often say, what is the limiting principle here? 
why is it that you would say that when they incorporate British practice, they wanted to stop at ex officials? They would say, official, everyone agrees you can impeach officials, um, executive branch officials. We go a little bit down the road to the you know, historical practice by including judges too. And then you say, okay, let's go to ex, who are mentioned in the constitution with a good behavior standard. But then you say, okay, let's go to ex officials. Why is it stopped there? That's my term. Why doesn't it go to private citizen? When article one, you're right, uses that language, but then no language is used in the discussion of impeachment in terms of limitations on who's a potential uh, defendant. Uh, Julian, uh, prior priorly, um, Julian, are you with us? Uh, and if so, can you uh, show your video and unmute yourself and you can ask your question? Julian. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, yeah, I'm Julian Pro. I was actually one of Professor Kleinerman's former students. I just had a question as far as the, um, the idea that impeaching him because he's a former president wouldn't work that just seems to sort of lay down like a bad precedent because what would that do then for next presidents in their lame duck session who have control of one of the houses of Congress, especially a president like Trump who had so much con like populist control with the people? I mentioned yeah. uh, one thing I didn't mention. Uh, oh, sorry. Ben, no, do you no, want to no. continue your lessons with uh, your former No, no, no. <laughs> correct fine. the errors of your He's class. graduated in law school now in California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are you doing? You're screwing up, sending more <laughs> of your students to law school. What is wrong with you? So I, I, I just wanted to mention one other thing. It, it's actually a great question. It gives me an opportunity to do this here. Is, um, uh, elsewhere in the Federalist Papers, where they are talking about how do you constrain executives, it's, uh, you know, Hamilton says, you know, we, we've had this discussion, can you prosecute a president while he or she is, is still in office? But Hamilton says in the Federalist Papers quite clearly, I think, that once the president leaves office, he is subject to prosecution. Trump is not immune from prosecution. I mean, if, if you want to, um, a, a federal prosecutor could charge Trump with, and the U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C. apparently is thinking about this, charging him with conspiring, right? which is actually much easier to prove than incitement, conspiring in this attack on the Capitol. Uh, so it's not that I think presidents have this kind of immunity uh, for everything they do right at the end of the office because they're still gonna be subject to prosecution by the Justice Department under the following. Uh, right? Now we have a practice and tradition uh, because we don't wanna be kind of like a banana republic where we turn on the last party and prosecute all the officials but I, I, I would totally agree uh, if this is uh, what Jeff and Ben mean that President Trump could be subject to prosecution for his involvement in the attack on the Capitol. Uh, and, and if they charge it right, he wouldn't have this defense of free speech uh, behind him as he does, I think, to the, you know, to the House charge. Uh, Jeff, uh, oh, go, please go ahead, Ben. I, uh, well, first of all, John, I try to talk them out of law school generally, so Julian didn't listen to me. <laughs> 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 hey, you guys, hey, this happens a lot. It keeps us in business over here. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I would have share, I, I'm not sure presidents should be subject to prosecution after they leave office. I mean, it be, it, because that's hard. I mean, there are lots of things they have to do that skirt on legality in a way that, that it becomes dangerous to subject to prosecution. So I'm actually surprised, John, that you're, you're, okay with that prosecution after after leaving office because i just think the nature of presidential authority is such that prosecuting after office subjects presidents to judgments that i'm not sure make sense given what they have to do with the president yeah i'm only for i'm only say it's okay because hamilton did <laughs> i mean it's a, yeah i mean it uh, yeah, yeah i agree with you obviously it opens up a whole can of worms about the yeah, you know, what the yeah, you know, what the presidents can and can't do, but yeah, I just think that Hamilton says it clearly in the Constitution as an alternative to impeachment. Philip, can I ask John a question that I didn't understand from his remarks? So, yeah. as I understand it, you don't disagree that the last month of Trump's uh, term it was condemnable behavior. Uh, I don't disagree. You don't disagree with that, but you fear that I. Uh, that having a trial on an impeachment charge that was hastily passed at the end, uh, 
raises all sorts of troubling precedents you mentioned in your original remarks. And, and I didn't understand what those were. What are the troubling precedents? So first it is uh, expanding, think about the difference. Um, and I think this makes more sense in terms of the founding, right? Where uh, they cared much more about, <laughs> they cared much more about reputation and shame right, than you know, perhaps our you know, President Trump, right? But they, uh, if the worst thing you could do to someone uh, was to put them under this reputational stain of disqualification, right? Uh, then being able to try someone after they left office means that Congress, you know, Congress's control over those presidents is going to be magnified because a future Congress could always come back and punish reputationally that president. Now, I read um, Ben to be saying that was a positive actually here that uh, impeaching Trump here and trying him would be a good deterrent for people in the future. But also on the other hand, it also means that congressional power over the president is going to increase because it's it's going to have a kind of, I don't know, ex post facto ability to always come back and punish a president years later. Now, that's not as bad as criminal prosecution, of course, but where for, you could be put in what? jail. But for what? The reason I asked you uh, that I thought you did agree with how egregious his behavior was um, it obviously wouldn't be troubling if some future president did similarly egregious behavior. Behavior, You're troubled by the possibility that some president would do something that wasn't bad and be, and I don't, I don't see how that precedent follows. I just don't see why you're afraid of that. Well, suppose you're a, a president and you uh, want to take some action in the last few weeks of your presidency and you're not doing it. You know, you don't think you're you you as the president don't think you're doing it for treasonous purposes or to overthrow the government, but um, you think you're doing it for you know, the public interest or the public good. But if you have in the back of your mind that Congress could always come along and right, disqualify you, I, I, I would look. The founders even talk about just being impeached itself, even without being convicted, as a you know shame, a shameful punishment on your reputation. Don't you think that that creates a deterrent on the part of that president at that time to taking that measure? Now, Congress may not exercise it in that case, but it's going to sit on the mind of a of a president. Actually, which is actually some reason why you also like the idea. Let me just finish it because this is a good conversation, if I can, Philip. So. Yeah. Imagine a president much earlier in the term does the kind of thing that I think is a great example that you've brought up, which is that they're going to take some action that is very, very controversial, but in their own view is in the public good. It might be some sort of prerogative type action like Ben Kleinerman has written about and, and you have written about, which is an action that that might even go against the laws in the service of the, uh, the public good in some fashion, all right? Now, impeachment and the possibility of trial stand there as, uh, in a good way as making that president think really hard about doing that. And so the president does think hard about doing it. They do do it. They might or might not be impeached and convicted for it, all right? So why is that any different at the end of the term? It's the same thing. But my point is that, um, okay, suppose you're the first year of the term uh, and you do something you think is, is, is controversial, you think it's public interest, but you know a lot of people in Congress are gonna think you did something wrong. Uh, if you take the view that the president, former presidents can be impeached then you have just ratcheted up Congress's control of you because whether it's the first year or the fourth year, you can always be impeached and, and disqualified for that. Right? So it's not, it's not even a difference between the first year and the fourth year. Under the theory that you can impeach a former officer, you could impeach him, you can impeach a president for the thing he did in his first year, 10 years after he leaves office or she leaves office, correct? correct? So if that's the case, I'm gonna say across the board, you have increased the uh, congressional control over the president, because you can always impeach after they've left office. 
I guess given the relationship between Congress and the president right now, it doesn't worry me if the president has to worry a little bit more about Congress. I mean, it's to me that's one of the problems right now is presidents worry almost not at all about congressional control over their behavior. And that's not just Trump, that preceded Trump. Um, so if this, I'm actually, I don't find your worst case scenario all that compelling. It strikes me as good if presidents need to think a little bit more about what Congress thinks about their behavior. What I find, what I find uh, hard to get my head around, John, is that we're in a situation today in which a president has clearly done something really bad that goes to the heart of the way democracies function. And it it's pretty. It looks pretty clear that he's going to be acquitted from this. It's it's not easy to do an, a trial impeachment uh, under any circumstances, and so your fear that presidents would be subject to the kind of abuse of a Congress impeaching and convicting them for things that are far far less egregious just doesn't seem to me realistic for all the reasons you say about earlier about requiring a two thirds vote and all that sort of thing. I just don't see the danger there. I just, I just don't see the, the political danger that that poses as a, as a political precedent. I mean, sometimes lawyers get so worked up in precedents because of the way they work in courtrooms, but the way they work in politics is slightly <laughs> different. And I just don't see this as a bad political precedent because what we're saying here basically is yes, if you have a president uh, at the end of their term that does bad stuff, uh, they've got, they're going to be held account. And that's a good kind of precedent. But it would have to be stuff that is similar to the kind of thing that Trump's being charged with. I, uh, this exchange was uh, is fantastic. We're past time, and I want to be respectful uh, of your time. But uh, I wonder if we uh, could talk just a few minutes about just the sort of raw politics of uh, the trial and possible conviction. Um, I mean, it strikes me that the incentives for the various um, um, players are confusing or, or mixed. And we had a question asked in the chat, um, if we can't have the grand inquest that Professor Tulis suggested would be good for the nation, um, look, uh, President Trump or former President Trump being disqualified from office again uh, clearly would help certain Republicans in the Senate. And our questioner asked, and doesn't it doesn't a trial actually help Trump in, in so far as it keeps him in the press, it keeps attention on him. Um, so let, just a few thoughts about your politics of this. Uh, would it actually be better for um, some Democrats if, if the trial didn't happen? And would it actually be better for some Republicans if uh, Trump was uh, convicted and disbarred, disqualified from office again? On that last question, I mean, I'm a little surprised, I guess, given the nature of primaries and the Trump base, it's not that surprising. But I'm a little surprised that there aren't, isn't, there aren't more Republicans who would prefer Trump to leave the Republican Party. Um, you know, there was some point at which McConnell said a few things that looked like he might have that opinion, but, you know, he didn't sort of follow it out. I, it just, I don't think at the, at the end of the day, a sensible Republican can't think tr the Trump phenomenon is good for the party as a whole. It, it makes it a sort of rump party that can only get elected in certain parts of the country. Um, so let, let me push the point here, though. Isn't the real danger to the Republican Party and not Trump as a Republican now, but Trump as a non-Republican running? I mean, uh, Republicans could eliminate Trump as a competitor by disqualifying from office. It seems like in some ways Republicans have more to gain from that than the Democrats, just in a raw political yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why it, it surprises me there isn't more willingness in the Republicans to take that that path. Um, I'm not sure that if Trump- What Philip's saying, uh, Ben, is that if he, for example, started a third party or something like that, it might be uh, 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 more harmful to Republicans than if he were disqualified from office. Uh, the, the difficulty I have with these kinds of political uh, prognostications is that we all have and Republican candidates have all been so bad at them in the past. I mean, nobody thought that Trump would win. Uh, 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 as AOC uh, just said in her, she gave a long account of the trauma she experienced during January 6th in the course of it. 
she expressed dismay that, that Cruz and Hawley and some others have not stepped up to apologize for their role, however unintentional, if that's the way they feel about it, it was. And she said, and the reason for that is that they imagine that they can pick up on the base that Trump has. She points out, I think quite insightfully, that you can't just assume that, uh, uh, that a, a demagogic personality-based following is just going to move to somebody else. You, you just, if, if that's the nature of it. Um, and so the, the way the politics is going to play out is really, really unpredictable. And I think that counts <clears throat> as further evidence for why the Congress of the United States should do its duty uh, and not be spending so much time trying to game out how it's going to affect one's personal political ambitions. John, any thoughts? No, I, I, I defer to you experts on the politics. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I mean, <laughs> my read on it, just this is another area where the, uh, you know, the founders of the Constitution didn't anticipate the future because they didn't, right? They, they didn't want or, or they didn't know of modern political parties. And so they would never have thought the president would coordinate with his own political party in the Senate to defeat, you know, to defeat an impeachment charge just because of a political loyalty. But I, I totally buy the, seems right to me, the political analysis that the Republicans are voting uh, because they want to keep the new voters that Trump brought into the party, into the party. Um, but I, I have to say, and, and this is, uh, you also know, think about this a lot more than I do, which is that's why the constitutional argument is so convenient right, for opponents, because they can say, ah, I'm not defending Trump. I'm not claiming he did incitement or not. Just the fact that he's not an officer anymore is enough for me to vote against conviction. Um, and setting a precedent, I mean, there's only... But there's only one previous case from 1876 of a past officer being impeached after they left office and wasn't it was a secretary of war not secretary of president so this might chalk up as a precedent going the other way in the future but it's really just for political reasons it seems to me yeah mostly but, political reasons. Uh, I, I maybe I, I should explain that my question you know I'm teaching Machiavelli next week so these things are uh, on my mind um uh, now, Ben and Jeff, you've recently started a new website. Uh, tell us about that uh, real quickly, and you've both been writing on these issues and others. Um, well, I guess since I'm editing it, I'll, I'll say something about it. The, so the Constitutionalists, we, you know, the aim is to treat current politics, broadly speaking, in terms of constitutional issues, but not that by that we mean not so much legal issues as norms and cultures around the constitution, things that maintain a constitution. So we've had um, pieces on, you know, the, the most recent piece that we all sort of really liked was on barbarism and the, how close is the society rests toward, on the kind of precipice of barbarism. So that the, that, those kinds of articles. I'm trying to think of other examples, but yeah, the constitutionalist.org, you should check it out, especially if you enjoyed what went on today. You'll hear more from both me and from Professor Trulis. So. Okay, it's a great it's a great new publication. And I think you're doing it with our friends at Jack Miller Center. Uh, yeah, and then Jack John, Miller you, Center. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've, uh, you've written, um, uh, you uh, wrote about many of the issues in National Review Online, is that right? Yeah, I don't have my own website. I got to get a grant from the Miller Center too. <laughs> so uh, I just, yeah, I just write in some, I've written some in national. You write for us, John. You're welcome to write something for us. <laughs> and John, yeah, NRO is where I posted a bunch. And I think I have another one tomorrow. Okay, so we'll look for your next piece uh, tomorrow. And John, you're often on TV. Any TV appearances tonight? Oh, uh, this morning, right before this, I was. <laughs> but that was about recalling Gavin Newsom. Much more interesting than convicting Trump. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the uh, Montpelier Foundation. Um, really a, a first rate conversation, so thank you. Thank you again, and if you enjoyed you. today's program, please come back and join us later this month. We'll be having a lecture by Michael Zuckert on uh, slavery in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, John Yu, Jeff Tulis, uh, Ben Kleinman, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.